Jean Andrew Jarrett is the Dean of the Faculty and William S. Todd Professor of English at Princeton University. He's also the author of 2011's Representing the Race, A New Political History of African American Literature and Deans and Truants, Race and Realism in African American Literature from 2007. His scholarship on tonight's subject also re resulted in his co-editing The Collected Novels of Paul Lawrence Dunbar and The Complete Stories of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Among other academic titles and textbooks in 2014, Dr. Jarrett also edited a sweeping survey, the two-part Wiley Blackwell Anthology of African American Literature covering the years 1746 to the present. Tom Morgan is the program director for race and ethnic studies and an associate professor of English at the University of Dayton. His research focuses on the politics of narrative form, uh, African-American haiku, the short story in the late 19th century, uh, I should say in late, late 19th century periodical culture, and of course, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He co-edited the complete stories of Paul Lawrence Dunbar with uh, Dr. Jarrett and is currently working on a new edition of his poetry. That's Dunbar's poetry. It's an honor and a pleasure to have these two scholars join us tonight to discuss an under-considered voice in, African, in uh, American literature. Honestly, almost the best case I can make for virtual programs at Town Hall because the odds of getting you both in the same physical room are considerably lower. So with that, please welcome Tom Morgan and Jean Andrew Jarrett. Thank you. Thank you for having us tonight. So Jean, here we are again. That's right. You know, uh, nice to spend time with you, Tom. It's been a while since we've seen each other, but uh, it's, it's always nice to, to, to get a chance to hear you talk a bit more about Dunbar and our, our long association connection with him. Um, I, mean, I guess just as, as a starting question, it's been a while. I know you've been working on the biography for a while. What were some of the hardest parts about writing this biography? That's a, that's a great question, Tom. Um, so I've been working on this biography for over 10 years. Uh, and um, this is the third book that I've written. And uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar played uh, an important role in my earlier books. And so in Dean's Intruance, which was mentioned, he was uh, an author of a novel called The Uncalled that did not have um, uh, African-American characters in the traditional sense in it. Um, and he also was a uh, kind of wide ranging author of essays as well as fiction. Uh, and, uh, and poetry. And so he was a key figure in my work that, that uh, concentrates on the late 19th century and early uh, 20th century. And so by the time we got to about 10, 12 years ago, you know, I made the decision uh, that I wanted to write a comprehensive biography of his life and his literature. That is to say a book that encompasses all aspects of his personal life, his professional life, his intellectual life, uh, and also his relationships uh, with uh, various uh, acquaintances. So I guess the hardest part of writing a biography is, is uh, the same kind of thing that affects a lot of biographers, is just trying to corral all of the information about him and also trying to verify what is fact and, and what is fiction. You know, there are certain parts of Dunbar's life that's rather sensational. There are certain parts of his life that you could regard as mythical lore that's been passed on over time. And, and the thing that you know, I try to do is to uh, pay attention to what are the kinds of things that could be factually verified and what are the things that are actually anecdotal, you know, the kinds of things that fuel, uh, I guess, an imagination of him uh, in a, uh, a kind of a fascinating way, even if it's not uh, entirely uh, true. And so the thing that I had to balance over, over the course of writing the biography is just uh, having a compelling story, a story that uh, is informative, but it's also a story that tried to be definitive in terms of the kinds of information that we could say is, is uh, factually uh, uh, verifiable or, or the kinds of things that I think are rooted in uh, particular aspects of uh, American history and wider uh, uh, Western history. Thank you. I mean, I guess I also probably should start with, I always forget this because you and I have talked about it so much. What do people need to know about Paul Lawrence Dunbar as a person to give them some context for what we're talking about here? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, you know, the thing about Dunbar that's interesting is he was a, prodigi a prodigious and a prolific author, uh, but he died young. And, you know, so he died uh, in, in his early 30s when he was, you know, 33. 
Um, and uh, what's remarkable is how, despite the circumstances of being an African-American writer of the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, despite the specters of racism and discrimination and, and, um, and uh, you know, Jim Crow segregation, he was able to excel as a thinker and as a writer. Uh, so in the midst of that, it's a remarkable American story, someone who was born to enslaved parents, uh, parents who had um, endured slavery, had survived into the post-bell 19th century. And he was someone who learned from them, learned about African-American experiences from them. And he went on to uh, recreate uh, their stories in his own uh, literature. And he was able uh, to be rather successful in doing so from a commercial standpoint. Um, I think what's also interesting about Dunbar is that he was a person of great contradictions. On the one hand, he is someone who um, enjoyed the success of publishing literature, uh, but at the same time, he despaired that in certain respects, he was being um, uh, you know, preconceived as someone who, who wrote best in a certain kind of way, such as in you know, the, the dialect of either presumably illiterate slaves and, and their descendants, right? And so in that respect, he was grappling with the caricatures of African-American life. But on the other hand, he was dependent on his um, expertise in that kind of genre in order to be successful. Uh, so I would say that overall, it's a remarkable American story. Uh, it's the story of someone who was excellent and, and who died in my view rather prematurely, but he's also someone who uh, turned out to be a, a person of great contradictions. Thank you. One thing I've always found really fascinating is, is the, the number of interesting people that Paul crossed across, his life crossed across with theirs. And so, I mean, I guess probably would, another thing would be helpful. Could you talk a bit about Dunbar's experience with the Wright brothers? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And so, you know, Dunbar was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, when he uh, went to uh, uh, Central High School, uh, he crossed paths with Orville Wright. Orville Wright um, was one of the uh, Wright brothers, as you mentioned, and who would go on to be one of the legendary, legendary aviators of, of America. And so what, what's quite interesting is that Paul Arms Dunbar, an African-American young man, and Orville Wright, um, a, a white person, um, at that time, and this is around 1890, they were actual classmates in um, Central uh, High School uh, in Dayton. Uh, and they decided to work together to edit a, a newspaper called the Dayton Tatler. It was a kind of an entrepreneurial venture between the two where uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was able to uh, circulate, circulate a newsletter for the African-American community. And this uh, newsletter also catered to the strength of Orville Wright and Wilbur Wright in uh, overseeing a, a, um, a print shop. Uh, that is to say, they had a, a great um, uh, printing house where they, were, where they were printing either newspapers on the one hand or newsletters for the African-American and, and, and other kinds of communities of, of Dayton, Ohio. And so it, in a way, it was a kind of a match made in heaven between these two. And it's remarkable to think that you know, prior to Dunbar's success as a poet, he had this kind of entrepreneurial collaboration with Orville Wright. And prior to Orville's own success in being an inventor, he was close friends with uh, an African-American. And so that this kind of reconciliation, this, this kind of um, uh, social marriage between the two uh, as they were in this venture uh, is a remarkable story of how two people can come together despite the backdrop of uh, segregation and racial prejudice in Ohio, especially. You also cross paths with two presidents. And I think that's an interesting sort of like opposite end sort of experience he had. Would you like to talk a bit about both of those or? Yeah, you know, there's one that, that I would I would say, uh, especially uh, he had a close uh, relationship with, uh, and that was uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and so Theodore Roosevelt was someone who, um, you know, he Dunbar first became acquainted with him when he was governor of New York. And then, as you know, later on, uh, 
uh, Roosevelt will become uh, president of the United States. And uh, Roosevelt actually um, was rather endeared to Dunbar because Dunbar uh, was obviously at that time a, a, an excellent poet. Uh, he was also someone who um, was a, a supporter of Theodore Roosevelt. And in this way, anytime uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar ran into uh, any difficulties, if you will, uh, in his own life, or if he had certain questions about uh, certain kinds of opportunities that lay ahead of him or for his friends, um, he uh, you know, actually reached out to Theodore Roosevelt. And you'd find that um, even though there's quite a bit of literature on Theodore Roosevelt's life and his connections with others, uh, very few talk about the relationship between uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, and, and Theodore Roosevelt. And so I, I would say that that is the kind of relationship that I would say is, is, is uppermost uh, for him, particularly at that time. One question I was thinking about earlier today when I was, was setting up for this, I don't think I've ever asked you is what first got you interested in Dunbar? Yeah, so uh, so I think it goes all the way back to when I was um, a junior um, in college. So I went to Princeton as an undergrad, and um, I had to. Uh, I was in a course taught by Tony Morrison in my junior year. It's called Studies in American Africanism, and that course focused on representations of blackness in Anglo American literature. And at the same time, I had to produce a junior thesis. And uh, I decided to look at the opposite of that, look at how African-American authors produced literature that did not refer to African-American experiences. At that time, I talked about African-American writers who constructed whiteness in their literature. And it turns out that as I was doing research on the kinds of literature that were published um, across history that fit into this genre, I could hardly find them in the library. Uh, because a lot of these works were not canonized. Uh, what tended to be, I guess, canonized or taught in classrooms or, or reprinted tended to be authentic African-American literature or African-American literature about African-American experiences. Uh, I would say that that is a valuable kind of literature that we um, should still continue to teach today. And I've taught that as well. Um, but I also argued at that time, decades ago, you know, what about this you know, more anomalous genre that not many people know about. And so Paul Lawrence Dunbar actually wrote literature in that category. On the one hand, he wrote poems in formal English that may not have had explicitly racial markers. And that kind of poetry was not as uh, valorized, if you will, as the kinds of poems that were in ex expressively Black uh, dialect or that refer to African-American history and experiences. He also published a novel called The Uncalled. Uh, it's published in 1898. And this novel um, is based in Dexter, Ohio. It's rather um, autobiographical, uh, but it doesn't fit into the mold of the kind of canonical or traditional African-American literature that I just spoke about. And so that, that fascinated me early on with Dunbar. I tried to understand how he was someone who is ambidextrous in different kinds of African-American literature, if you will. And I kind of remained in touch with his work uh, ever since. My next question sort of picks up on that because you talked about some of the, 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 the genre experimentation with, on the one hand, the novels, there's also the short stories, the poetry, we could go on and on. I mean, what should we sort of make of his ability to produce in so many genres? Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, I, I will say that he was known especially as the poet laureate of his race. You know, that was a phrase used at that time. It had great commercial value. It had great cultural traction. And how people understood Dunbar was mainly in terms of his poetry. He also, beyond publishing books of poetry, he syndicated, he syndicated his poems across newspapers. He also recited his poems rather widely uh, in the United States and even uh, in Europe, especially when he visited uh, England. Um, but he was also, as you know, Tom, a rather versatile writer. Uh, so he was especially um, insightful as an author of essays. So he published essays in periodicals at the turn of the 20th century. 
he was also, uh, he also had produced robust novels. He produced four novels uh, that were published at that time. And they go from The Uncalled, which is what I just discussed, all the way to ultimately The Sport of the Gods. And he was uh, rather deft in handling different genres of American literature, like realism and naturalism. Uh, he also, um, uh, in addition to writing poetry, he he, he took a stab at drama, and so he um, had, had written in that form. And also he had written songs such as, you know, librettos uh, for uh, musicals. And so, um, so I, in a way, he covered the, the expanse of uh, literary writing at that time. And I think one of the benefits that we have now is, in retrospect, we can see that he was a truly versatile um, artist um, at, at, in the late uh, in early late 19th and early 20th century. And I think we have an occasion now over the next several months in terms of celebrating the 150th anniversary of his birth to, to know more about him and, and, and his writings. Yeah. Yeah, I've always been struck by his third novel, The Fanatics, which is a sort of a, a historical novel about the Civil War that, that all the white authors who wrote historical novels about the Civil War sort of have lots of focus and engagement that one of the few historical novels about the Civil War written by a Black author has almost disappeared from American criticism, and it, it's always struck me as odd. But. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's interesting because that novel, The Fanatics, it, you know, his father fought uh, in the Civil War on behalf of the Union Army, and so Dunbar, in terms of his personal life, was rooted in the experience of the Civil War. You know, it, it, you know the Civil War kind of shaped the way uh, his father navigated the country as he tried to flee um, uh, slavery. It also uh, affected the way in which uh, his his mother, Matilda, actually made a transition to Dayton, Ohio. So against the backdrop of the Civil War, um, you found uh, an American literature where writers, even as you go late into the 19th century, were still trying to understand that, that experience. And Dunbar himself in The Fanatics was trying to make sense of it, trying to understand how families were under great pressure, uh, how they were torn apart by uh, the ideological differences that came up as in the Civil War and its aftermath. And, um, and in a way, he used um, that as a backdrop to, to tell that story of how you know, people can, can be torn apart, but how people also can come together eventually. Yeah. I mean, the, the sectional difference that sort of like it remained before and after and how it came to the forefront with some of that. Um, you, you touched a bit on Dunbar's like recitation and his work with his poetry, right? Could you talk a bit more about some of the sort of tensions he faced as a sort of professional between his dialect verse and his standard verse? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a very important uh, distinction that we have to make. And so, uh, you know, black dialect or vernacular, as it's also called, it was, it tried to approximate uh, colloquial or informal speech, uh, particularly uh, for um, its representation of African Americans. Uh, it tried to indicate uh, the ways in which an African American person is not as educated. In other words, it was the kind of let, uh, language that presumed that someone was not able to speak in formal or high English, the kind of English that is refined through some degree of, of education. And so uh, he wrote in that language quite well, actually. Uh, and it's from the, the, the voices that he heard when he was uh, growing up uh, in his household. Uh, so he heard it from his parents who's, um, who, who had a uh, demonstrated either that kind of language or he had um, people in his kind of personal circle uh, who uh, spoke in that language, those who were formal, uh, former slaves. Um, but on the other hand, he also was a rather elegant writer of, of, of language. Uh, and so you have the kind of poetry, the kind of quote unquote standard English or formal English that um, was that you could encounter in, you know, Victorian literature at the time, or some of the kind of more, you know, refined uh, uh, poetry of, of uh, American writers uh, at that time. And he was able to, Dunbar was able to oscillate between these two modes of writing. And so what you find is that when you read his books of poetry, 
you can see you know, quite a few poems in, in one kind of mode of writing in terms of formal or standard English. And on the other hand, you could see quite a few um, poems that were written in this Black dialect. I, I guess I will say that he, he not only wrote in dialect that's supposed to suggest African-American voice, but he wrote in a dialect that represented regional voices or, or certain kinds of voices or certain kind of dialect that represented people from international uh, backgrounds. And I, and I would also add that, um, you know, by moving from between one and, and the other, you know, the critics actually praised the dialect work in some instances more than the one in, in formal English. And so when he ultimately would recite his poems, when he would perform them, he leaned very much on performing his poems in uh, dialect as opposed to those in, in formal uh, English. Yeah, when working on the new collection of poetry, sort of watching him, some of him, like the process of him learning dialect in his early poetry before like 1893's Oak and Ivy, some of the early poems, you're like, this is a great poem, but I can understand now as I do, like why it was not a successful poem because it didn't follow the expected literary conventions of the time period, right? And you're like, that's too bad because of the ways that happened. Because I also think in the way in which Dunbar was influenced by James Whitcomb Riley, you know, and another famous dialect poet who from, from the area. And, and yet Riley had a much different experience with this than Dunbar did. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, I would say that, you know, Dunbar, um, he did associate very much with a, a, a mid, quote unquote, Midwestern literary culture. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, Wickham Riley was one of them uh, who he, um, as, as Dunbar would attend um, the uh, Writers Association conferences where particularly the Midwestern writers would participate in, he, he used it as a chance to learn more about uh, writers in this, in this cohort. Um, and, I, and I would also say that, um, you know, given his versatility, um, I think it's important to, I think I've, you know, I've, he's been characterized as an African-American uh, writer. Um, of course, he's an American writer generally, but you could also characterize him as a regionalist uh, writer. Uh, and so I think as time goes on, we'll get a better appreciation of, of how well he wrote in this genre. Yeah, the number of poems that are sort of white regional poems, and even some of the later short fiction, which I know you're very familiar with, you did work on, that are like white life stories, part of Dunbar's over that sort of most people don't even talk about, which is yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, but I will say that as time goes on, and this is where, uh, you know, the kind of work that we're producing, Tom, uh, proves useful. And so I think if you look at many writers across history, whether you go from, you know, from Shakespeare all the way up to writers um, in the uh, 19th century into the 20th century, some of the foundational information that's required uh, includes uh, a biography, right? And so having this kind of robust um, biographical foundation is, is crucial, uh, but also uh, having a comprehensive collection of his works. And so we, you and I worked on um, the complete stories of Paul Lawrence Dunbar as a collection. You know, you're working uh, as well on this complete coll collection of his poetry. And I think the more that we can put his information and his literature out there, I think the more insightful uh, and um, serendipitous some of the scholarship can be on his work. Yeah. Another part of our long set of experiences together, like how do we sort of get this work out there for people? So you, you mentioned briefly previously that you'd been working on this biography for over a decade, right? What kept you going while you were working on that biography or was there moments when you sort of like didn't know what to do or how to proceed? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a great question. You know, there are you know a whole range of stories of writers who work on books for for a long period, and part of the way through they might lose the manuscript or lose their train of thought or uh, kind of run into writer's block. And so I was very sensitive to uh, doing my best to complete uh, the work. I was very grateful that I was uh, fortunate. I mean, I, we live in a time now where. Yeah, I wasn't working on a typewriter. I, mean, I was able to um, establish multiple copies of the manuscript in different places. 
Um, and so uh, I think there's the benefit of technology nowadays enabled me uh, as it's enabled other writers to kind of persevere. I, I should also say that, you know, once you embark on this kind of work, you know, I, I think, you know, you have certain cornerstones of information at your disposal. And so we know the full scale, more or less the full scale of his writing. Um, there were already a number of older biographies to, to work with. You and I worked on uh, the letters of correspondence, and you know it was it, that was one of the most important uh, uh, pieces of information that we had in order to you know lay the groundwork of his work. And I think the goal then at that point was how do you interweave all these pieces of information? And uh, I, I think the thing that uh, that I tried to do is um, just to have faith that uh, you know as long as I worked hard on it that I would be able to cross some kind of finish line. Um, I will say that I thought that I would, when I started off, that it would take me only a handful of years, such as five years to finish, but it took me longer than that. And also life calls, you know, I, um, you know, I had multiple children that were born during this time. I changed jobs, uh, different universities. Um, also, there are moments when you have to do more research. There's sometimes you have to work on the writing a bit more. Uh, you have other professional obligations. So I'm just happy to know that despite all of those, uh, and sometimes because of all of those circumstances, I was able to finish. I mean, I know that via conversation with you for over the course of time, you know a lot about Dunbar. Um, but in writing the book, because it's always when you're writing a book, you discover new things. What was the most interesting new thing or what was the biggest surprise that was a new thing that you learned while writing the biography? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, I, I think that dovetails with the distinction between writing a biography and writing a scholarly book on Dunbar. Uh, you know, I've written chapters of previous books on Dunbar and those kinds of works focus on what he wrote. And I do account for the historical context and also the literary context of his writing. Um, What's different about a biography is that you not only can do that, but you have to focus on the private life, the, the kind of the inner contradictions or conflicts that he was going through, the ways in which he was a rather ordinary person, but the, also the moments where he was extraordinary. And I, I, the thing that surprised me was as I took a closer look at his uh, letters, for example, I realized that he was someone who had uh, great insecurity about his success. So even though he was ultimately um, uh, prolific and he published multiple works of um, poetry and, and fiction and, and, and essays, um, it was also true that he was insecure about his writing. And there were times when he had to um, you know, talk to others. You know, there were mentors in his life that he wrote letters to um, in order to get feedback and to inspire some confidence. Uh, he also reached out to who turned out to be his wife, Alice Ruth Moore, someone who was able to receive information about how he was grappling with some of these inner demons, uh, either th th these kinds of moments where he was insecure about whether he would succeed, but also ways in which he um, was kind of emotionally unstable based on the certain circumstances of, of his life. And so when you, when you put all these things together, you find that he's a remarkably, if you will, a multi-dimensional person. And it was in that context that I was surprised by how complex he was as an individual, uh, such that you know, by the time I finished writing the biography that he was, a, in my view, in my mind, a kind of a, kind of a, a, a fully fleshed out individual who if he walked through that door, I would almost have a sense of his personality. Um, and, and I wanted to, do the best I could in order to recreate that for, for readers. Thanks for sharing that. That's actually, that's a better summation than I could have made, but I, I fully agree with, with all of that. Um, if you think about the sort of larger writing process of all this work, would you have done anything differently? You know, I, I think, well, obviously I'm quite pleased with how um, this, uh, uh, biography played out. And so um, on one hand, I would say no. But on the other hand, uh, you know, I, I will say that um, 
th there were different parts uh, to the book. And so on the one hand, uh, as I mentioned, I depended a lot on his letters of correspondence. And so we have his earliest letters in the uh, 1890s and you can work your way from there until the end of his uh, life. Uh, but there's also a period of time before uh, uh, when he was you know, not really writing a lot of letters to people or we don't have that uh, information at our disposal. And there's also the lives of his parents who um, as, as you know, uh, former slaves, you know, slavery really disrupts the historical archive. So it was difficult to track down a lot of information uh, about his parents. And so I do think that I probably spent more time uh, than I needed to trying to, uh, uh, to, to, to learn about his parents. I'm pleased with what I was able to gather, uh, but I think there was a moment in the course of writing uh, the section, for example, the first couple of chapters of the biography about his parents, uh, that you know, uh, slavery itself makes it very difficult to pin down the lives of people who were enslaved who also were not literate. And so as opposed to people like uh, you know, Frederick Douglass or uh, Harriet Jacobs or William Wills Brown, you know, slaves who actually wrote their per autobiographies or, or, or memoirs, slave narratives as we call them. You know, uh, Matilda Dunbar and Joshua Dunbar, Dun uh, Paul and Dunbar's parents did not write such narrative. They did not have diaries uh, or early on in their lives. And so uh, the, the challenge of kind of recreating those lives was Im immensely uh, difficult. And uh, so I probably would have been a bit more efficient in, in dealing with that. Yeah. Who inspired Dunbar? Now that's a, that's a really um, uh, broad uh, question, right? And, and um, so you would say who inspired him as, a, as an individual or, or, or as a writer? I think as, a, as an individual, as a writer, I mean, I, you could ask, I'd say answering that across as many dimensions as you'd like, right? As, as a person, as a writer, right? Even as a, like an activist, because hmm. he has that aspect of his life as well. Yeah, I would say one person who inspired him uh, was his mother, uh, because she was a resilient person who endured slavery. She had two uh, boys from a previous relationship who she took with her to settle down in Dayton, Ohio, and, and they turned out to be uh, half brothers to Paul Arndt's number when he was born. And she was someone who was a domestic laborer, as it was called at that time, and she was able to raise her children and to inspire in Paul the importance of reading well and, and writing. And so I, I would say that early on in his life, um, uh, you know, she was a, a key inspiration for him. Um, I would also say, um, you know, you have, uh, you know, James Whitcomb Riley, you know, there are examples of how he um, praised his work and, and, and Dunbar turned to him as someone uh, to be appreciated who could provide him some uh, insight um, to his work. Uh, there was also uh, you know, someone by the name of, uh, you know, James Newton Matthews. He was a, a someone that Dunbar had been in touch with. He was a kind of a, a, a nurse while uh, not, not truly canonical writer, uh, James Newton Matthews, but he was someone who uh, was able to provide some degree of mentorship uh, for Dunbar at crucial moments of his life when he was insecure about his professional uh, prospects. Uh, I will say that, you know, Booker T. Washington, you know, even though uh, many people would characterize Booker T. Washington as being, you know, controversial in terms of his advocacy for vocational education, Booker T. Washington was also extremely successful at what he did. And uh, Dunbar saw in Washington someone who was able to move audiences and to pierce uh, the noise uh, of uh, the uh, public sphere in order to get his message out. And although there are moments when Dunbar disagreed with the philosophies of, book, educational philosophy of Booker T. Washington, I think uh, Booker T. Washington nonetheless was admirably successful in, in certain respects. So, so that's the full set of people I would say, and I'm, they're, they're, I'm sure there are probably more. Yeah. I mean, you touched a bit on Booker T. Washington, I guess, because I know that, that Dunbar also crossed paths with, for example, Alexander Crummel, 
with Frederick Douglass, right? And also with, with W.B. Du Bois, right? What were some of his relations? Because again, they all held radically different perspectives on some of the issues that sort of Dunbar engaged. How did Dunbar negotiate all those yeah. different people and voices and perspectives? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Frederick Douglass, because that's another person who inspired him, uh, someone who he marveled at. Uh, you know, he met uh, Frederick Douglass, for example, at the um, the uh, World's, Columbia, uh, Ex World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. And Frederick D uh, Douglass had a key leadership role in terms of an ambassadorship to, uh, to, to Haiti, uh, as well as being a longstanding uh, statesman. Um, and so uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar connected with Douglas and Douglas at that time, although he was towards the latter part of his life, he was going to die, he was going to pass away only a couple of years later. Uh, Dunbar had a firsthand experience in kind of being an apprentice, you know, underneath uh, the, um, the, 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 the arm of someone like Douglas, who um, many people admired by that time uh, in his life. And so that was one kind of uh, relationship. Uh, you mentioned uh, Alexander Crummel. Uh, you know, Alexander Crummel was someone who uh, uh, Dunbar had corresponded with when Dunbar was trying to seek opportunities as a teacher, uh, uh, and uh, particularly uh, around uh, as, as Dunbar was, you know, trying to advance into in his professional career. He was also thinking about other uh, opportunities, and Alexander Crummel tried to provide some degree of of, of uh, inside um, uh, influence for him to, to gain certain opportunities. Uh, I would also say regarding W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois is often characterized as being at philosophical odds with Booker T. Washington. On the one hand, Booker T. Washington talked about uh, vocational training for African Americans. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois prized uh, higher, the life of the mind, this kind of intensive academic learning as a way to advance uh, Black political interests. But there was a period of time when uh, uh, Dunbar uh, had a relationship with both of them, even though they were at odds. They also uh, were uh, on occasion, would, would be part of events uh, together. And, and it's also true that uh, as, as uh, Dunbar himself was thinking about opportunities in terms of publication, you know, Dunbar and W.B. Du Bois would be in, in correspondence about what they could, how they could collaborate together. All of these things I, I touch on uh, in the uh, biography. For those of you that don't know, du Bo uh, Dunbar's life was cut short by tuberculosis and he spent time in Colorado as an attempt to sort of recover from that. Um, how did those experiences sort of impact his career? Yeah, and so I, in many ways. So first of all, uh, you're right. He went out to Colorado at that time, um, at the turn of the 20th century. A number of people who were affected by tuberculosis, or you know, it's also been called consumption, uh, they would go out west because the air was just more um, um, it kind of was clearer. It wasn't as polluted it was perceived and it gave people a chance to convalesce and so Dunbar was part of the group of, of people who went out to um, uh, the west as it were um, in order to to get better physically uh, and in that context you know it inspired his imagination you know he he published essays uh, he, he wrote uh, a, a novel his particularly uh, you know second novel, the love of Landry uh, while he was uh, out there uh, he also uh, published poetry, marveling at the, the kind of Western horizon. And, uh, and this was also a place where uh, we, we do have stories of how uh, he was trying to understand, you know, his life in relation to Alice. You know, I think they had a turbulent um, a domestic life together. There was some turbulence, especially when he was uh, in Colorado. And so that sowed the seeds of how uh, his life would be viewed uh, in, in retrospect. It, it's also true that while he was in Colorado, he nonetheless toured that region to recite poems. He uh, reconnected with uh, Booker T. Washington, who spent time out there. Um, and, and that kind of indicates how uh, Dunbar and Washington had a sustainable relationship, regardless of where they were. 
uh, in, in the country. And, and so I think it was, it was a fascinating moment um, in his life, but I think it also touches on something that you began this question with about um, how he wasn't always physically healthy. Uh, in fact, he was a, there were times when he could be a rather frail uh, individual and he did what he could at times to get better, but, but when he uh, endured this kind of premature or when he went through a premature death, it was the kind of the culmination of many years of being ill. Yeah. yeah. It's unfortunate. It would have been nicer if he would have continued on and made it into the Harlem Renaissance, what he would have been like as a figure there. Yeah, um, Dunbar lived in a lot of sort of different cities. I mean, he started out in Dayton, but he, he, he experienced Washington, D.C. He experienced Chicago, he experienced New York. Did this impact his career or his trajectory in any particular way? Or how would that sort of, because he also then returned to, returned to Dayton at the end of his life. Yeah, that's right. And so, uh, so a few things. First of all, um, you know, when he returned from uh, England, um, he did see that being living in New York City, that that was a great city of opportunity in terms of access to uh, professional opportunities. It was also near where, you know, Alice Ruth Moore was actually was a teacher. Uh, and, uh, and it was in that environment that, um, you know, they were able to build that uh, relationship and be part of a, a particular social network. They were also part of a network in Washington, D.C. And so the as it was called, the elite African-American community was established and growing in the Washington, D.C. area. It's also true that, uh, you know, he, you know, in the wake of returning from uh, England, he was in England in uh, around uh, you know, 1898, uh, that he uh, went on to uh, work at the Library of Congress. And so that was a key experience for him uh, as he was trying to grow into a writer, but also trying to uh, understand what opportunities may exist for him outside of uh, that world. Uh, as I did touch on, he did spend time uh, in uh, Chicago early on as part of the Columbia Exposition. And it's also true that many, a number of members of his family, his half brothers and his mother, you know, resided in Chicago, particularly before Dunbar had returned to Dayton, where he, you know, purchased a home and his mother uh, came for, to spend time with him. Uh, for quite a bit. And so uh, there's a way, as you suggest, he uh, kind of toured these, these number, these various cities. I should also add that he spent some time in Florida, you know, with James Weldon Johnson. Uh, and that's one of the places where they, you know, James Weldon Johnson himself learned more about Dunbar's views on poetry, which uh, James Weldon Johnson would apply later on uh, in the Harlem, closer to the Harlem Renaissance in terms of his poetics of African-American life. And so there are these various moments that I talk about in the biography where um, in certain cities, he built relationships with certain individuals that would have an impact on the kind of work that he produced, but also how he thought about his craft. One, one place I'd be remiss if I didn't sort of engage before we were done here is thinking about Dunbar's relationship with editors, right? On the one hand, there's William Dean Howells, who directly impacted his career um, quite a bit, but he subsequently had sort of ongoing relationships with a number of editors, right? The Century, right? Lippincott's, the Saturday Evening Post, right? And this is even when he's later, when he was very famous, right? And so he was able to sort of have a, a much different relationship. How did that impact his career? Yeah, certainly, uh, I, I would say that the, 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 the greatest figure of, of all those you mentioned is um, William Dean Howells. And so he was the so-called Dean of American Literature at that time. He was uh, uh, someone who had a relationship with you know, Mark Twain, but also with Henry James. Uh, he was a formidable figure of, of um, literary criticism, but he was also a, a, a tastemaker. He was someone who defined um, the perspectives of uh, the public with respect to the kinds of literature that they should read. And so when uh, William Dean Howells came across Dunbar's work around 1895, particularly the book Majors and Minors, and said that it was the kind of book that people should read, and we can talk about the implications of that praise, um, that had a remarkable impact on, on Dunbar's life. And so I, I would say that that kind of relationship was crucial in the sense that uh, Howells, uh, you know, he, 
edited this column in a called you know Life and Le Letters in um, Harper's Weekly, and it, it was this kind of um, uh, column that was read by by many. Um, but Dunbar also, as you say, uh, tried to build relationship with a variety of editors. Certainly, Century Magazine was one of the the uh, magazines that he uh, that was among his favorite. There was also a uh, Lippincott's magazine uh, that was a, a key thing that he published his work in. And so there was a period of time when he was circulating his work to a number of periodicals and being in touch with a full array of, of editors and some of them turned down his work, but over time, some of them accepted his work. And so I think he had built up a, a wide um, network of acquisition editors who uh, he, he worked with. As we turn towards the end of our conversation, I guess one of the things I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk a bit about is what can Paul Lawrence Dunbar still show us today? How can we think about what we know about him from then as it applies to a contemporary moment? I think that's a that's a great a great question. You know, tomorrow I have a, an essay that's coming out in the uh, Washington Post, and I, the title of it is is you know why Paul Lawrence Dunbar still matters in America. And this article, uh, this essay talks about how Dunbar, as you said, uh, was a versatile writer, but he also produced uh, key essays talking about the American condition with respect to race and racism. And so, you know, one of the essays that he published during his time, um, such as in the Toledo Journal, was the race question discussed about the Wilmington, uh, North Carolina uh, uh, riots of the late uh, 19th century. And it was a, an essay that focused on how you had an African-American community that was becoming increasingly successful in terms of its economic and political power, but as a result of white supremacy and uh, racist conduct, uh, it was uh, crippled. And that affected that and, and the kind of conflict between the black community and the white community actually uh, affected the life fortunes of the black community. Uh, henceforth. And so I point out how Dunbar was rather prescient about how some of the very local challenges that African American communities were facing um, can belie the progress that they're making from a national standpoint. And so even though we have the amendments of reconstruction that was enfranchising um, African Americans with respect to their civil rights at the federal level, in terms of these constitutional progress that Blacks were making. It's also true that at the local level, there were these setbacks. And so I tie that uh, insight that Dunbar provides in these essays to some of the local challenges we face, including you know, what happened to George Floyd, how uh, the, his murder in the street in Minnesota actually galvanized the nation, or the ways in which the, the murder of, of African Americans in Buffalo, uh, even though it's in Buffalo, that bespeaks the challenges we face as, as a country. So that link between the local and the national uh, dovetails with Dunbar's uh, character as someone who's from the Midwest, from the small town of Dayton, as it was called at that time, but someone who could uh, be a kind of a national spokesperson for uh, racial uh, progress. So I kind of make that link and, and, and I discussed that in this essay that should be in the Washington Post tomorrow. That's, actually, that's fantastic. That actually connects a lot of the things we talked about, the sort of like local national characteristics of, of, of Paul, Paul's work across many sort of aspects of what he does. Um, what would be sort of one thing you'd wanna leave everyone who's here tonight with to take with them about Paul Lawrence Dunbar as, they, as we depart? Yeah, I would say that uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar is someone who was just like you and me. He was an ordinary person who had uh, great ambitions, who had dreams of succeeding in this country. He's someone who came from a family of great struggle, and he uh, became ultimately successful through his talent and his hard work as a writer. And so I think that is a key element uh, that I think will inspire uh, a lot of us. Uh, but I would also say on the other hand that he was a person who is, as much as he was successful, he was also flawed. 
know, he was someone who was uh, insecure. He was someone who um, had a volatile personality in his private life. Uh, he was someone who, on the one hand, was grateful for the praise that he received, but privately he despaired over what it might imply. And so I think if there's anything that I'd like people to uh, come away with is how Dunbar could in a way be an emblem of what it mean, what it meant to be an American in the late 19th century who was trying to aspire as a writer and have an impact on the world, but someone who was conflicted and challenged by uh, the issues of race that was affecting many people at that time and, and up until today. And that was, thank you very much, Gene. That was actually, that's a very nice way to think about drawing some connections out for sort of Dunbar and what to take away. Right, and thank you. And, uh, and I'll say, you know, uh, Tom, that, you know, this, this conversation we're having, my hope is that there are more such conversations that occur, not necessarily only with me, but with others <laughs> who are excited by uh, what Dunbar's stories uh, can tell them, but also about uh, the implications of these stories and of his life for, for their own lives today. And the fact that, I mean, like, you know, as you point out early on, right, uh, June 27th of this year is the 150th anniversary, right, of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's birth. And so it's a fortuitous moment. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking to you all from Dayton, Ohio, Dunbar's birthplace and, and where he died. Um, and I'm looking forward to the events that will be happening uh, the weekend, uh, two week, not this ne next weekend, but the following weekend to sort of commemorate Dunbar's sort of birth and the sort of work that's still going on and what he still represents to a contemporaneous audience. Yeah, I think so. And I'll be there. And, uh, and you know, you and I will reconnect finally in person after all this time. Uh, but I think it should be a, a special occasion for a lot of people there. And hopefully it'll ripple out to the rest of the country. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, you know, I, I think I was honored uh, to, to uh, be at this event. Uh, I think we had a great conversation. Um, and uh, if, if people have, uh, you know, interest in, the, in learning more about Dunbar, I would encourage them to um, uh, read uh, the biography, which um, I hope will, you will find compelling and, and informative. I found it fantastic, and I've read it multiple times. I know, and thank you for not charging me all the times you had to read it. Uh, you know, I would say Tom is uh, like a brother, someone who I've known for decades, who's, you know, um, uh, looked at my work. And so I'm really, and I acknowledge you, I hope you notice in there. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, so I want to thank you for all the work that you've been doing with Dunbar. And I think, and I couldn't have done this without you. So I want to thank you. That's wonderful. Um, Tom, thank you so much for leading this conversation. And Jean, thank you for zooming in late with us over here in Seattle and sharing your story and your journey. I definitely learned more about Dunbar than I've ever learned before, but I'm so intrigued. Um, so intrigued so that I would like to buy a copy of the book. And for all my friends who'd like to buy a copy of the book, please go look at the YouTube chat link um, from Princeton University Press. So thank you both and everyone at home. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.